Hello everyone, welcome to the stream. Today we will be working on a new PMOD for the icebreaker, which will allow you to connect uh, game controllers from uh, 8-bit classic 8-bit uh, consoles to your FPGA on the icebreaker or another FPGA that has a PMOD connector. And uh, to show you what it is, uh, let me go here to the desk. Uh, on the desk, so these are the game pads that are I bought from Adafruit. These are unfortunately not originals. So the Adafruit game pads that how these work is uh, they are not USB or or serial. They actually are just shift registers. So inside is a shift register. When you press the button, the bits of that. Uh, multiplexer <laughs> is basically set to one or zero and then you have a latch pin a clock pin and you clock out the status of the buttons so you you make a strobe and latch the status of the buttons and then with clock you can shift out the status out of the out of the controller and this makes it very easy to actually hook up on, to an FPGA it is much easier than having a a USB, a USB controller that are much more popular these days and you can buy fairly broadly or Bluetooth. So you don't need special chips to do Bluetooth, you don't need special microcontroller or a design that can speak USB. And this is very natural for an FPGA to do where you can just uh, latch and clock out data. So I, because for the icebreaker we already have an HDMI a PMOD that occupies two PMODs and uh, you get HDMI out. We can, thanks to pretty amazing work from uh, Sylvain, we can actually do 1080p HDMI out of the icebreaker using this encoder chip that we have on here. So it is not directly speaking HDMI to the monitor, but it is uh, using a special chip, which is a digital video interface encoder chip because uh, if you see this connector is HDMI, but to officially call it HDMI, you would need to get certification and a license. So we actually call it DVI. And we just happen to use the HDMI connector that is very popular. And the encoding on here uh, is used, uh, you, we are using a DVI chip uh, encoder. And the problem with that is we could use theoretically an HDMI dedicated uh, encoder chip. Those come only under NDA. So you don't get a data sheet, you can't uh, really use them unless you do um, sign an NDA because of the encryption keys that are on there for uh, DRM uh, security. So this is another one of the many reasons why DRM is horrible because we can't just uh, use this technology freely and build our own things because of uh, the DRM stuff and having to sign paperwork, legal paperwork, to be able to use it. So anyway, so we are get around this by using a chip that doesn't have any of the encryption stuff in it, but they are not very common. There is fortunately two manufacturers making compatible, and uh, you can uh, and you can find those uh, PMODs on uh, One Bit Squared. So you can buy them as well as on uh, now Mauser and uh, Crowd Supply, so we have them available. So anyways, uh, we, we also have in the forums um, some uh, uh, people, so we, Dave Shaw, he made a port of NES and Game Boy to the ICE-40 a while ago, based on a core from uh, another FPGA project. And so um, then we had a member from the community also ported to the icebreaker. It uh, seems to work with uh, VGA output pretty well. With the HDMI output, I am having some timing issues still, so I cannot reproduce his results, but he got it to work. I'm sure we can improve the situation with the NES port. Uh, still, uh, it should be possible to get it to work uh, with correct timing so that HDMI monitors can at least uh, um, read this. 
what we were missing and was part of the conversation there is a PMOD that we would allow us to connect uh, gamepads. So that's what we are trying to address today. And 24-hour um, reconnect with Looney. <laughs> you missed it. I'm sorry. So anyways, uh, the second thing be besides the classic shift register based uh, um, deep uh, game controllers that we will be able to connect to here. We still have, will have two pins left, so we want to get audio out for the board too. So because we have only three PMODs, the first two PMODs will be used for HDMI. In theory, we can use only one uh, with a reduced color depth. We can uh, actually use one HDMI connector and then connect here something else like memory, for example, or use uh, the piggyback uh, solution for the uh, PSRAM, which is also an option. So here we will be making, a, so the requirement for this PMOD is be able to connect up to four gamepads and get stereo audio out. So this is what we will be working on today. I did start a little bit work there. Uh, so Bidluni, you were asking before why... Um, yes, you do need to use the TDMSIC because you could theoretically drive uh, low resolution, low speed stuff directly, maybe from the ICE-40. So it's theoretically maybe possible, <laughs> but it is so much easier. We can drive up to 1080p out of the ICE-40 if we use the encoder chip. So yeah. Uh, it makes it also the design so much easier. Uh, so uh, so this is, makes also so much easier the design. You don't need to um, uh, implement it in the FPGA. You save a lot of resources. So you can, especially for teaching purposes, where people want to learn and also be able to design their own uh, graphics core, for example, this is essentially driven like an, a VGA output connector, which is super simple. You just have colors and you have a clock, you have a, a horizontal line, strobe, uh, and H-sync and V-sync. And uh, this makes it uh, so much easier for teaching people how to drive uh, a monitor. So for class uh, environments, it's much nicer. Yes, I did see the Supercon badge. It's like, we, we have multiple, so the, the yeah. <laughs> so the ones, the controllers that I have here is the ones that I bought. Uh, the, uh, these are from Adafruit that I bought. So these are fakes and clones. Uh, they are cheap, as, very cheap, but uh, they feel horrible. They are super mushy, super weird. Uh, so I definitely will be getting uh, original uh, SNES and NES uh, controllers. I already have one original NES controller that I bought not so long ago. So this is an actual NES controller from an actual NES. So that's really cool. Uh, and we will we will be uh, so this design will be compatible with either this or the SNES controller. So at least that's the the goal. I think some other controllers maybe for the Mega Drive or something used a similar system with the shift register, so it might be compatible with those, but I didn't look it up, so I, I'm not sure. <laughs> that's, that's a complete tangent. It's like for the LED strip, I don't know. It's some, uh, some 5 volt or 12 volt power supply I got from Adafruit, I think. It's a 5 amp power supply brick that I got. Yeah, so um, I did find the controllers on eBay, the original ones, not knockoffs, for like $20 each. So they're not that expensive. You can get them. And they're either refurbished or not refurbished. It's like it fluctuates between like 20 and $30 per controller, which for a good quality controller that you will actually be using for something, that is not terrible in my book. Um, 
but uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, indeed the, the knockoffs that are super cheap, they are really bad. But uh, they are there, this is what I currently have. I, I got them uh, quite a while ago. So anyways, let's uh, switch to the desktop here and uh, start with the schematic. So I did start a little bit work on this. So there's uh, some requirements I had. I, the thing that uh, I already looked at before, so there's Bob Miller, K-Bob, if you are still here. So he has this board, which is discontinued, but, it's, uh, but he gave that as a reference. This one has HDMI out, uh, it has seven segment displays, has two NES controller outputs and audio, as well as PS2 connectors, uh, which is nice. Um, and I did look through this here. And if you, let's see, can I make it bigger? Maybe I downloaded it, wait a second. Yes, I did, very smart. Okay, so um, so this guy is using four P mods next to each other. So we don't have that on the icebreaker. So this is already a deal breaker for us, but uh, it has some of the circuitry that we can refer to. Uh, one thing is uh, it is connecting just the NES controllers directly directly to 3.3 volts officially. So they are actually 5 volt devices, but in many cases, or probably in most cases, they could be just powered by 3.3 volts and then directly connected to the FPGA over 3.3 volts because as uh, everyone knows, the FPGAs don't like 5 volts. <laughs> And uh, uh, so, uh, JKIV, thank you for the follow. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, so uh, the problem, I, it would work in probably most cases, but that's not how I like doing things. I like doing it a little bit more reliable. So I will be, uh, I will be adding level shifters to connect all this. So that's uh, definitely happening. I, that's as you saw probably from the LED panel driver board. So the LED panel driver board, which is this one for driving this, these guys, these LED panels. So you have LED panels, the 64 by 64, for example, which you can also buy from us and one bit squared. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, also running on five volts. It does work in many cases uh, on 3.3 uh, volts. So this uh, PMOD by default is wired so that uh, you are, these level shifters are essentially bypassed. They are powered from both sides with 3.3 volts. But uh, there are panels that have issues with that. So you can add the additional auxiliary 5 volt supply, which is an extension of the PMOD standard that we did. Uh, together with um, uh, with uh, Black Mesa Labs, uh, so we expanded it and added this five volt connector between the P mods. So we, you can add five volts and power this from five volts and have the panel run uh, I/O on five volts. So it turned out to be a good decision to have those level shifters. So uh, we will do that, and we will do that also for the controllers, just to make sure. By default, they will be wired for 3.3 volts, and uh, if uh, uh, we don't need, uh, if we want the 5 volts, we can always wire the 5 volts additionally. So that's that's one story. Then the second story is the audio interface, which is also a, a okay reference here. Um, we can we can also talk here about the HDMI stuff really quick. So you see, HDMI is very simple. You have just resistor ladders for the colors, and then you have H sync and V sync. For the HDMI encoder chip, it's the same. So it's uh, you can reuse designs that are also for um, for VGA. You have to be more stringent about the timing than VGA is, but more people have HDMI, so it's uh, easier to use. Uh, camera overlay. Oh, yeah, <laughs> my face. Oh, sorry. Okay. 
Thank you for letting me know. I will pull this out. There we go. Let's do this this way. Still do this big. All right, that should be better. There we go. So this is the relevant part. So we have the NES controllers, which are directly connected to 3.3 volts, and then we have the audio. Uh, and so this is the easiest thing to do. It is taking 3.3K resistor and then uh, 4.7 nanofarad capacitor that was a gotcha yesterday <laughs> that was hilarious so i i somehow was off by three uh magnitudes i somehow in my head i swapped between nano and pico and i thought this is 4.7 microfarad <laughs> capacitor which would have a cutoff frequency of like 10 hertz and then tnt after or sylvan when i when i posted this he was like Wait a second, that doesn't make sense what you're still talking about, the, the values there. <laughs> so yeah, he caught it and was like, oh, that's... Uh. So this is 4.7 nanofarad. It's like, I hate when people use the like expanded thousands uh, notation. It's really annoying. Just write 4 and 7. Done. <laughs> then I know what it is. <laughs> and the 4,700 4, 4, picofarad, it's like, why? Why do you do that? This is such a weird notation. Anyways, it is just style, whatever. Uh, so yeah, uh, we will be, uh, this is an option, so we can do that. And these are actually polar capacitors in, on this board. But if you think about the uh, headphones, for example, if you plug in headphones in here, they are usually 30, uh, 36 ohm uh, load which will be quite a massive load on the circuit. So they that will not really work very well. Uh, we can start with that for testing purposes, maybe, but um, there is another design that we could drive from this, which is I2S requires three pins. So this is out of the question in this here because we are out of pins. So we can't do I2S. Um, yeah, so, uh, so uh, yeah, so anyways, <laughs> I got lost for a second there. There is a very nice design that uh, Bob Miller made, which is the audio repair board. Oh man, I should have pulled this out. Audio repair board for the up, uh, uh, for the one up. Where do I have that box? I should show you what it is because this is very cool. Where is my one up? Where did I put this away? Uh, yeah, I think I charger. Ah, yeah, found it. Haha. <laughs> one up. So one up is a project that is based on the one bit C, which is then STM32 uh, development board that we did a while ago. And this is a project that I did in my engineering procrastination. So this is this guy. It was like a engineering vacation that I did, that I did for like two months and I designed this thing. Uh, so this is it. So it is the, um, is the one bit C uh, STM32 F4. Uh, microcontroller and uh, this is essentially a Game Boy. It uses uh, uh, 18650 batteries. It has an SD card interface. It has here, these are shift registers. So the gamepad is controlled exactly how these guys are being controlled. So uh, it is uh, exactly compatible. And then it has an LCD on here and it is essentially like a DIY Game Boy. Uh, let's see if I can, if I have a battery. Maybe that one is even charged, who knows? Let's not put it in the wrong way around. And see if this works still. So this is, this is Bob's uh, demo on this guy, which is really beautiful. And this is a game I started working on. And you see, Oh, let's see if I, we can focus on this. 
So on here, in the t on the top, sorry for the reflections, you see the bits that are being set or reset on the on the game controller. So I can move the sprite here. It is smooth. It's interesting. So it in real life it is smoother. It is like jumpy on the camera for some reason, but it's very smooth in real life. So I think there is some camera thing going on. But yeah, so this is uh, something we worked on and Bob made this uh, so it turned out that my audio circuit was a complete junk. It was it was bad. Uh, there are two main things that I screwed up. So one thing was I used these uh, this is the only SMD connector that I ever used that I actually managed to rip off. So audio jack plugged in was ripping this off. Yeah, so something with the video on the on this camera is weird. So it might be the Elgato um, thing. The cover is screwed up. Oh, great. Thank you. Very encouraging. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Anyways, so, so uh, I, um, um, so we, we, it turned out that this was, uh, so the main issue was actually the uh, potentiometer for volume control. So if you see here, there are buttons on the side for volume control. And so I wanted to use a digital potentiometer and it turns out uh, digital potentiometers are very uh, yeah you have to be very careful with them and it's like I don't exactly remember what the issues were but it didn't really work well as well as the connector was ripping off and uh, the audio was very uh, artifacty and had like spikes and weirdness so it was not good so Bob went and created this add-on board which solders on top of the um, one up uh, or the one bit C and connects to these pins and creates really nice beautiful audio with uh, with volume control here which is uh, just a potentiometer and so this design is much better and it's tested so uh, we will uh, we could probably use this instead my camera is screwed up yes always Anyways, so uh, that's uh, something we should uh, look into and uh, maybe copy. And then there is a third thing. So let me put this away really quick. Or maybe I will leave it here. It's fine. Uh, if we look here. Sylvain pointed out yesterday when I mentioned the topic that he made a very interesting video not so long ago. So October 2018, so a little bit over a year ago, so not that long ago. And in that video, he was talking about PDM versus PWM outputs and higher precision for lower noise. I really recommend watching that video from Sylvain, then you will understand the theory much better and he talks about additional things. And what he does, the main thing that this does is using the PWM or the PDM signal and in going into the audio out into the output path and it is using an inverted black white life thank you for the fellow welcome to the stream uh, and it uses an inverted version of that same signal AC coupled to get rid of the high frequency components of the uh, square wave signal going into the into the output and this way you can get a much higher quality, much smoother signal by getting rid of some of the high, high frequency components uh, of the signal by just uh, having an inverted uh, path uh, going into the output. So first thought was because if you look on the schematic of the board, we have two audio outputs. So we have two pins. We could theoretically have a um, secondary mode here where we have run this as mono output and then feed the circuitry that Sylvain showed what is going on here this is definitely wrong anyways 
I just realized that, that there's both capacitors connected to one. Um, but yeah. Come on. Go away. Ah! S escape. There. This is wrong. Let's do this correct while I already see it. So yeah. Uh, so uh, we could use two outputs to only get a mono output with higher quality. But then Sylvain started digging and was like, what if we could use a chip that has a buffer and an inverter inside so that we can... Yes, I do realize that. <laughs> I do realize that. I, I didn't fix it yesterday. Let's, uh, let's fix that while we are already at it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks <for that. laughs> Oh man. Yeah. I know, I'm terrible at this. Nano! Nano! Uh, yes, yes, yes. Nano Farad. 4N7. Ugh. Yeah, see what would I do without you people? It's like, that's why I have the chat to so that I don't screw up as much. Okay, so that's fixed. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, we could use these two outputs or we could use an, in, uh, an integrated inverter and buffer chip to generate the two complementary signals. And he found a while ago this beautiful chip from NXP, so if you look here, so oh, let me go back re really quick back here. So this is the level shifting for the game con game pads. So that this is also for an NXP part that I'm using. I'm using it for the Black Magic probe. Uh, is that this chip is also from NXP and it has a just a buffer and an inverter, and they should be matched. And so we can just use this part to drive both audio outputs, the stereo output. So we get we get stereo output with the same benefits of improved quality um, because we can actively filter out the higher frequency components of the signal, which makes it very interesting. So, uh, and yes, uh, DVD Freitag, that's... Uh, uh, definitely improving the strength, uh, drive strength. So I was actually thinking we should give it a try without the amplifier first and build this without the amplifier using just these buffers and then see how terrible it is. <laughs> maybe use an audio preamp or something externally and then maybe in the next revision of the PMOD we can add the proper amplifier from Bob. Uh, into this design. So just let's do a little bit of iterative design here. Yeah, won't change much. Yeah, 3K. Yeah, this is high impedance. Yeah, 3K3. So maybe. The alternative would be to probably change the um, RC filter uh, relationship and have a lower resistor path uh, to the um, headphones. So we could probably play around with that. That might be a solution too. Um, so um, yeah, so the, the, another question I had because I have like, zero experience with audio design. Oh, Paul. Thank you. Welcome to the stream. It's like yeah, you might you might find this interesting because you made the audio shield <laughs> for for the so yeah so this is this is all inspired actually. So if, say hello to Paul who is uh, who designed the Teensy which I have here, which inspired a lot of the hardware that is on the desk here. So it inspired the one bit suit so I can have a JTAG target for testing things, which is on here. And then it also inspired um, inspired tiny FPGA and inspired the 
icebitsy or however we call it icebreaker bitsy so it's like there is a lot of wonderful stuff that thanks to paul is in existence so if you are looking for a good arduino experience get uh, a teensy do yourself a favor and get a teensy <laughs> so yeah um what else Yeah, DC bias on headphones sounds like a bad idea. So you might need to AC couple it in addition. Yeah, that might be a good idea. <laughs> well, yeah, this is a good side effect to get some ear warmers. Yeah, just just a disclaimer. I'm not an electrical engineer. I My background is just computer science. All of this electronic stuff I learn on myself and by being corrected by people that know better. So that's why I have you guys in the chat here to correct me and uh, make this actually a reasonable thing. So uh, uh, we are all learning a lot of stuff together and it's like, it's a, it's a group sourced knowledge here, which is nice. So yeah, um, the solution here uh, for now, uh, Yeah, so there's there are good questions coming in. <laughs> yeah, what is the good starter to get uh, get into electronics? I didn't use any books. Internet is your friend, um, and also other people's designs. I think that was a lot of my learning was actually taking some reference design from others and like modifying it and improving it. Uh, so yeah. Anyways, uh, this is so let's get back to what the current status is of the PMOD. So what we are doing is having latch clock and four uh, I.O. or inputs for the data coming from the D pads uh, or the um, game pads. That is one part. And then you, we have the level shifting, which is pre-wired. We have clock and latch, which, which is wired as an output and the direction pin is pulled high, which will uh, set these uh, level shifters to be, uh, to be outputs. And then we have these four, which are wired to ground and are inputs. I did add this resistor so that we can rewire it if we need to, which makes it a little bit more flexible, but we could just wire it directly to the signals, which uh, would be an option too. And then, uh, from the 8-pin uh, PMOD, we only have two pins left. So we have to do PB PDM, PWM, some type of uh, modulation in the FPGA directly. We cannot use I2S because I2S requires three pins, not two, uh, to answer Paul's uh, question. And so we will be driving this uh, output and uh, another thing we will add is the in inverter trick to get rid of the high frequency component. Yeah, we could do I2C. Yeah, great. I hate I2C. I'm not doing I2C. <laughs> I'm not playing with I2C if I'm not forced to because uh, I, I hate it. <laughs> it's a terrible protocol, super unreliable, finicky as hell. I'm not using it uh, with a 10-foot pole. I got burned hard with it in the past. Yeah, it's the worst, worst designed protocol ever. It's garbage, total garbage. <laughs> we could use SPDIF. That's true. That's actually, that's actually, I wouldn't mind using SPDIF, but all the pull-up uh, resistor-based uh, protocols are garbage, are terrible. Uh, because they are um, EMI, uh, their the EMI resistance is terrible. You cannot put it on any reasonable wires. You can put it on one PCB, but that's it. And uh, if you have full control over the system, that works. But uh, if you, there's plenty of people that are crazy enough to put it on wires and just distribute it on a on a bigger system, which is a horrible idea. Uh, all the EMI will just cause you issues, connectivity problems, and then you will have to like futz around forever. Uh, yes, I hate it deeply. <laughs> ITC is terrible. <laughs> yeah, so there you go, Sid. 
You're welcome. <laughs> So, uh, we are not doing ITC. SPDIF is not a bad idea, actually. Uh, we could do, uh, try that. I, I think we should uh, continue on this path for now and experiment with different protocols. Uh, um, different protocols in the future. Uh, we, <laughs> for now, we will we will just build it uh, uh, yes i know paul we need a quiet power supply for this for now we don't have a quiet power supply yet i will probably um yeah i that's yeah <laughs> automatization yeah i i did some some stuff in there but it's like we were doing can over ethernet mostly and so in automation, and that was that was a decent uh, solution that worked pretty well. Yeah, it is. That is bold engineer. Welcome to the stream too. Yes, I two C is meant for PC on one PCB communication. It is not uh, designed to be put on wires and into communicating to other uh, um, like put put in the in the field. So it is uh, it is not. It's not designed for that. It is not meant to be MI. It's like we, we had I2C uh, was used quite a lot in UAV autopilot stuff and communicating even to motor controllers. Man, that costed so much headaches. It was so painful. Uh, you sp the amount of work that uh, the uh, guys from, um, uh, now I'm blanking. Um, uh, yeah. <sighs> They they got bought later by by Intel. Anyways, they were using I square C on the motor controllers, and they spent good few months debugging and getting it right so that it just worked the I two C protocol to the motor controllers. Uh, uh, yes, this this was the first quadrocopters that you could commercially buy, essentially. So, um, well, second to first. Um, by this was XUFO successor or um, um, so I, I worked for for them for a while. I did my diploma thesis uh, at that company, and um, uh, they 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 decided to put I square C in there to make an uh, to make the motor control this detection easier. It's like there were good reasons why they decided to do that. But after that experience, and then later using the STM32 to do I square C also on uh, UAV, also for like, oh, IMU, let's connect the IMU over I square C. Oh my God, that was horrible. It's like the problems we were running into with reliability were just, why, why just not take this UAV and just before you fly it, trash it into the trash can? Uh, if you why 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 bother it's faster anyways <laughs> uh so yeah we switched everything to spi as well as differential c communication and can bus and this was reliable and that actually fixed a lot of issues uh, that we were running with reliability and so it was it was much better solution and since then i am like i am i am big hater on i square c because it's a it's great for like small boards it's like oh i have the toy here let's play with that and it's like okay great that works fine like for example i square c is on on the glasgow and it is applied correctly it is only for local communication between chips that are on the board and you have full control over it uh, it is not uh, designed to go off the board it's it's just for local communication to set up a few things. I'm fine with that, <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's like in general, if I can avoid it, I don't use it. Yeah. Also, like implementing I square C in an FPGA, the I square C protocol and like getting the um, um, good uh, hardware design that is reliable uh, for I square C is pretty tricky. It's not as simple as one would uh, one would think. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, that sounds wonderful. 
Oh man, William, I am so sorry. You have my condolences. Yeah. Yeah, arbitration loss. Yeah, it's it's like if you have especially people like users play around with I square C, you get a lot of like feedback. Oh, it doesn't work for me. It's like, yeah, did you check your wiring? <laughs> Do you have it on a breadboard? Um, yeah, stuff like that. It's it, there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of issues that I see. Um, yeah, if it is designed just right and it's like used for a specific purpose, and you really need to have multiple clients connected on one I2C interface, yeah, sure. But uh, if you if it's there's so many reasons not to use it where people are using it. So yeah. All right, <laughs> let's get back to this. You just you did manage to trigger me, and it's uh, and it's wonderful. Anyways, auto receiver from yeah. So the biggest problem I found. Sorry, it's like I one one last thing before I go. Uh, so STM thirty two I square C uh, hardware implementation is majorly broken they had multiple erratas coming coming out of it and like actually making it work reliably and is almost impossible because some of the flags of the errors are not being flagged when you expect them to and it is sometimes hard to say if it will be triggered it took us like several engineers worked for like at least half a year to a year to stabilize the stm32 driver in uh, um in uh, paparazzi UAV in the uh, uh, in that software, so we spent a huge amount of time to make a reliable driver for it. It was it was a huge amount of work to get that uh, right, and I know other chip manufacturers are using very similar or even the same IP for the I square C interface, which has similar issues where the the errors are not being triggered and oh horrible. Yeah, so the Atmega, Atmel I2C IP seems to be fairly okay. Um, but yeah, I I have plenty of other reasons to hate I2C too. It's like, it's not just the IP core. It's just the protocol itself too. And how people are using it. Yeah, anyways. <laughs> yeah, in a sense. Wow, that's that's impressive. Yeah, so errata sheets where you have like, oh, don't use this block, just do it by hand with Bitbang. Great. Okay, so uh, let's get back to this and uh, and do the way I thought I we should do this first. So one thing I really want to add are this uh, are a symbol for this this chip here. So we need to do this. Uh, I have to think for a second because this symbol I made myself and I probably should. Oh, so interesting thing what I didn't tell you about yet. Now this chip can go because we are not using it anymore. So let's remove that. Like this. Okay, so uh, this is actually a layout based on um, the single PMOT uh, LED panel driver board. So uh, that's, uh, I just used the outline and I'm keeping the five volt supply. So for the supply for the audio uh, amplifier to get it lower noise, definitely in the next revision, we should have a dedicated voltage regulator for this that is low noise and well filtered so, so that the amplifier itself gets very clean uh, power supply. For now, um, I want to see how like make it fairly simple for now and see how bad it is. And then we can improve it in the in the next revision of the board. Uh, ferrite bead and a cap, that might help. Yeah, I, let's do that for now and see if that will be enough. And then we can, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, do something, do something better later. Yeah. It will be fine. Famous last words. <laughs> Okey dokes. So, 
Um, right. And let's just sync it for now like this. Another thing I didn't tell you about. So one thing is this uh, level shifter. So I'm using the same level shifters as on the Black Magic probe. So these are the tiny things here. Um, let's see. Do I have a Black Magic probe to show you? So the Black Magic probe. Let's see under the microscope really quick. So this is it. So these are, you see the level shifters in here. So this is uh, what we added in the 2.1 version of the Blackmagic probe. This way, the Blackmagic probe can go down to 1.8 volt signaling even, uh, which some of the uh, boards have these days. And uh, we have a external power supply that you can supply power to the target side. So this is a true switch uh, circuit that we have here and then reset is here circuit anyways but these are the chips they are from nxp and i will use the same package because we can for the uh, buffer uh, it's not really necessary to be go that small in this design but uh, let's use what we have right and the second uh, second thing i need to tell you about Vulji, Vulji92, welcome to the stream, thank you for the follow. Uh, is that I will not be putting the connectors for, so this is an uh, SNES, these are SNES connectors, so you can source them from AliExpress uh, as a replacement part for uh, game consoles. So there are two types of these. Um, I don't have the NES, I have only the SNES connectors. Uh, they come with straight pins like this to mount on a PCB or with uh, right angle pins to mount. I don't know. They were, I don't know, $30 for a bag. I don't know. I, look on AliExpress, you can find them. I, I don't remember what the price was. Um, MEBX, welcome to the stream. Thanks for the follow. Um, yeah, so they they are they are probably roughly like a dollar or two um, per per unit, which is not very expensive, and so uh, we can we can use these. The problem is if you look at the size of the P mod. <laughs> so this is a single P mod. The width of the P mod is dictated by the standard. You can't go wider because uh, you want to be able to plug in multiple P mods next to each other. So uh, the only way of using these, if we were putting them on the PCB directly, is to put them something like this, and then put like multiple, like four. This would like result in a board that is like doesn't even fit in the frame, like huge board with like multiple connectors. So I don't want to do that. Uh, what I will do instead is uh, use. Um, um, Molex SL connectors, which have a clip, which will make wiring reliable if you put uh, a, this whole thing in a box. And um, I think what we will do is, in many cases, if you get the knockoffs, it's not a problem to just rip off the connector and put a, your own connector on. So that's a way of doing it. But if you have a genuine one, you don't want to hurt it, obviously. So uh, you want to use a connector so we will be designing, um, I will design a board that uh, takes these connectors and it's just a two layer cheap board that just has the connectors on and we can hook it up over with a wire to the PMOD. I think that's a more flexible solution. It will make it easier to use and we will be able to use uh, genuine controllers without uh, hurting them, which will be nice. Because preservation, you know? Like this is all starting to be museum, museum grade stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, I like the retro stuff, and I don't really want to destroy hardware that uh, you cannot reproduce, really. So it's uh, uh, we have to be a little bit conscious of that. Uh, but I uh, to save on space, you see, if we use the cell connectors, 
we can put four of them on the board without any problem and plug in there. It will not jump out on its own. And uh, I think this will be a decent solution. It's still missing the audio connector. I think the audio connector will go somewhere else. I'm not sure how I will do this yet. Um, but yeah, mm, maybe we will have the one set of connectors on the side. I don't know yet. But yeah, um, what we need to do now is uh, get the symbol for the inverter and buffer. And uh, let's see what the data sheet says with uh, respect to the pinout. Oh yeah, ah, they are just six pin. They are not eight pin, interesting. So that would be the, the really small one. We can also use the SOT363, which are also very tiny. Uh, so yeah. Let's see, let me think, let me think. What do we do here? I think I should just go in the schematic editor or the symbol editor and um, uh, and it's in misc and these are, oh, screen, right. Thank you, thank you. I'm glad you reminded me. Yes, so there we go. Um, so what do we have here? So these are shift registers for from a different project. So this is, so that would be this, 74 LVC, we could, change that and make just a triangle here for a buffer. Uh, we can remove the direction out of here. We can reuse the VCCB and uh, just make a tiny 1A. I think they are called that way too. Yeah, 1A, 2A, 1Y, 2Y. And uh, yeah, let's uh, modify this. Oh, also, what is the name of the part? It's a 74 AUP 2G. Is that the common name? Uh, 70 AUP 2G. Should I copy the whole thing? Probably. Oh, Derek Kozel, welcome to the stream too. <laughs> yeah, I, he, he makes really awesome streams about um, uh, GNU Radio, so you should uh, you should check him out too on Twitch if you want to learn about uh, hacker uh, hacker about uh, GNU Radio. <laughs> All right, so wrong window. There we go. What was I doing? I was file save as. Oh yeah, now I know. I should. Uh, there we go. Let's save this as this. There we go. Someone I think followed. Yeah, they are, they are very nice chips. I think we looked at the TPA parts too at some point. Uh, so, uh, Motherboard, thank you for your follow. Welcome to the stream. Uh, yeah, so the, okay, fine. Let's look at the amplifier from Bob because uh, I, I'm sure I will be get, getting a lot of questions there. Um, so I, this is what I would be using because the advantage of what Bob did is that you also get speakers, which is really nice. Uh, let's open this. File, open recent, audio repair. Yes, uh, yes, save, and yes, save, that's fine. Okay, so this is the audio repair board. Uh, 
And what he did here is use the PAM 8019, so 8019 KGR, which is a very nice part. And it has uh, a few controls and you have the left side input, right side input that is AC coupled, and then you have shutdown and mute. And yes, I think uh, um, what, uh, as Sylvain said, we should AC couple the output to the, um, to the audio jack on our board, no matter what. And then you have this differential drive uh, for the speakers output, and you have uh, this the audio jack. So you can plug in the audio jack and this will cut off the speakers and also it has a speaker amplifier, which is really nice. And especially if we um, at some point want to make uh, like a handheld, for example, like this one, we can keep using this design of the audio and it will become better with each uh, iteration. So I am a fan of that solution, what Bob came up with here. It was also a, quite a group effort. So I would like to reuse this uh, if we decide to go for a full amplifier. So that's, that's the idea here. Yes, it's definitely very nice. And yeah, it sounds great. Uh, and if you see here, it's like we have on this board, we have also speaker output. I did test it out. It, it works pretty well. But yeah, th this, is, this is another project that I would love to get back to eventually and do the Icebreaker or the Ice40 based uh, version of this. Uh, or ECP5 for that matter. That's why I really love the HUD badge. Uh, which is really, really awesome. <laughs> the hot patch amplifier. Yeah, uh, I think it wasn't great. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I will definitely, uh, I think I will go this path uh, if I go with the amplifier at all for now. But for now, let's, uh, let's just uh, stay, stay steady here. And um, yeah, I have to get back to here. Like I closed everything just to show you the amplifier that we will be using if we use it. And then MISC, PKL MISC, and we have this guy. And now we can get rid of the direction pin. Uh, we can get rid of this one. And now we should probably draw it because this is actually just meant for what the power supply side is, and then we can change the graphics here. Uh, yeah, I will keep this one, because this one is this side and this side. Okay, so let's, can I move this? Why, why am I not able to move this? This is weird. I can move this, can I grab this? Yeah, I can grab this, good. Uh, what is, was the grid that I was using on this when I was designing it? Uh, grid? Is that one smaller or something? I think it was. Yeah, it was one smaller. So first of all, uh, let's make this bigger. Four, it's like one, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, let's make it bigger and then let's see what I what I did here. Yeah. Let's do make this bigger. And grab. Uh, that should be nice and then Nope. Ah, grab 
this one. Will this work? Yes, good, good, good. Okay, and now we just need to add one more here. So this would be the buffer, right? I hear sounds from the outside because I have a window open. <laughs> I got startled for a second there. Like this, and then grab up two, left two, and then grab down two, left two, and then grab this, and then right two, and then grab right two. There we go. And now we just also need the circle here for the inverter. It's just for consistency reasons. I want to this symbol to look similar to what I had here. So I guess I need to move this line further. Will that work? Uh, grab something like that. Will that work? Probably will. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Looking good? I think that looks nice. I hope it can be approved of. <laughs> oh, I have to change the pins. Right, right, right. Very important. So let's change the pinout. Uh, pinout, 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 pinout. Let's see. One is 1A. One Uh, does this have, uh, no, I know that pads can be renamed really quickly, but not here. Uh, one, two is ground. Three, come on. Three is two A. That's correct. Four is two Y. Four, so this should be Y and four. Come on. Four is two Y, five is VCC. So this is VCC, five. And six will be one way. Y six. Okay, save this. All righty. Now let's place it in the schematic and put it in there. PKL misc, PKL misc. I should actually have a um, logic uh, logic collection library by now. So yeah, that's uh, so. This is that, and then we do uh, audio, and then VCC. We should do what as uh, as Sylvain su suggested. Yeah, so so my current take on uh, KiCad ERC is it's uh, problematic. I want to be diplomatic about this because people take it too harsh usually. Um, I I don't use it uh, really, and the ERC is uh, I I have a lot of I I don't like the way it is implemented. I they are it is a known issue. It will get better, and they are trying to fix it. But uh, at the moment, how it is put together, it um, I find it not very useful. And uh, I just leave everything as passives, and it's like to have the ERC shut up, essentially. I do use it for certain parts. I do use it for power supply chains. I don't use it for I.O. because 
setting it up right so that it actually handles IOs correctly. It's like in certain cases you want the pin to be just an input. In other cases you want the pin to be input and output in the same symbol. So you would need to adjust it on the fly, which causes, yeah, it's, yeah, it's not, not great. Uh, Mass Arpaggio, thank you for your follow. Welcome to the stream. So yeah, I I, I use a little bit of ER, and it's ERC. Just don't get it me wrong. It's not DRC. It's an ERC thing. Uh, I do use DRC a lot. That's uh, even though it is also has its own set of um, limitations. Uh, but yeah. Let's do this. So this will just go as an input here. We have to do the power supply with the inductor. So we should put an inductor or like a ferrite bead here and a capacitor for VCC. And I think the best thing would be to actually uh, supply them separately, both of the um, uh, both of these, so that we don't have any like possible crosstalk between the two um, buffers. And because we can. And now, this will be the interesting part that I have to look up how this worked. It's, this one is AC coupled and this one is uh, normally connected like here with the pull down. So I think, oh, I have the polar here. So we don't need this. <laughs> I will get into this in a second. So this is something I was thinking about yesterday, but it's not really necessary. So audio R, audio L, we can copy this block, or we copy this block later when I'm done with the, with the circuit here. So let's uh, add a capacitor, okay, 100 nano maybe. Uh, okay, this, and then Press O and this will adjust itself. So we need this guy. And like this, and then like this, and then we need inductor. And I don't think I have one floating around here. So let's do PKL device. Mm, where do I have this? L small. No. Diode. I'm pretty sure I have a ferrite here somewhere. I used to. Was I just using a resistor for this in the other designs? Should I just use this? Because a European standard uh, device should be, I think, a filled in square device. Diode, fuse, jumper, ferrite bead. Ah, ferrite beads are like this. Ferrite bead small. So let's put the ferrite bead from the main library then. It's fine. And then we can call it a 600. So I, I usually use the 600 ohm. We can change something different. Uh, 600 ohm at 10, megahertz or something. There should be a built-in. Yeah, there is a built-in, yes. But I, I was making my own symbols uh, because uh, they were a little bit smaller and a little bit tighter to design with. But yeah, I, that's true that the library is, uh, is getting better. And now I can use the uh, general one and I don't need to use my own one. And uh, as a footprint, we use the um, PKL0603. Uh, ta -ta -ta -ta, dipoles. Dipole. 0402 is the one that I was using usually. 
So I use uh, my own uh, footprints because they have those indicators between the pads, which I really like, so that I don't occupy more space on the PCB saying what type of part it is. So I, for diodes, I have this footprint. For capacitors, I have just a circle. And for uh, resistors, I have a square in the, in the middle. And for inductor, I have those squiggly lines. So yeah, that's what I use for, um, that's why I use my own library for the standard footprints. So we can do that. And we can do, and we just need 3.3 .3 volt supply. Like this, so that should do it. And the output will be, let's move this one, nope. Like this. Uh, and then this is also, well, this is not very correct. So this will, is something we have to change. It should be C small because we don't want it polar. So I was, <clears throat> I was thinking that we need to, for the audio to have a decent quality, we need to use uh, uh, either electrolytic capacitors or um, like uh, film capacitors. We can use film capacitors if we are SMD. So we might test that out if it actually improves the situation significantly enough for, for it to make sense. Consider also this, it's like what we are working on here is an 8-bit era or maybe 16-bit era uh, type of audio output. So square wave, sine, sine wave, uh, um, sawtooth. It, I'm not going here like for audiophile quality. I just want something that sounds well enough for reproduction of those era systems. So let's keep that in perspective. I know audiophiles will say it's like it has to be glass insulated uh, like foil and then cryogenically cooled because of reasons. So yeah, anyways, for smoother sound, for smoother digital sound, right? Uh, but yeah, no, there are certain things that actually make sense. So <laughs> it's not, it's not smash the poor audio files that uh, have too much money, too much. So this is uh, this is like that, and then we can copy this one, and let's look at the schematic from Sylvain. Where is it? So Sylvain said we should have a capacitor, then another resistor to combine this together. And then, so this would be the high pass. We can ignore this resistor ladder um, for basically a two bit DAC. Uh, so we just need the capacitor, resistor, resistor, capacitor, and we should be good for now, at least for this iteration. So let's uh, move this. Uh, I don't, can I do this? This will actually fit, wow. Like this, and then we can copy this one. And then connect, connect. And this goes like that. And like that, pretty, there we go. Will that work? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's also PDM audio. PDM audio with RC filter, so yeah. Oh yeah, cool. So I you already uh EMEBX Imbex? Is there a pronunciation that like encompasses the whole word that I'm not seeing at the moment? EMEBX? Emi Embex? 
Okay, sorry. <laughs> Just trying to parse parse your name in a good way. Sam Foster, welcome to the stream. I'm not sure I said hello before. <laughs> Yeah, you, I think I think even even this like separate from my like bias against uh, I square C, I think every technology causes some kind of issues sooner or later in some shape or form. I just uh, had less of those headaches with SPI, for example, which takes more pins. It's like that's the price you pay for sure. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's not all perfect. Uh, yeah, backspace. So let's, uh, so this should be audio R and we should copy this. The out output should be called X audio R. So this is the exit. And then we can keep this as a block. So that should be a nice good block that we can use. Now we can copy this one. Oh, yeah, uh, we can copy this and just con hook it up here. Oh, right, we wanted to have AC coupling, right? We did, we did. I'm not sure how big the capacitor for the AC coupling should be. I'm pretty sure this was something fairly small. I'm not sure. If someone has a recommendation, let me know. So let's AC couple this. So let's do that. Uh, do, 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 do. R5. Yeah, I can delete this. Delete this and delete this. Let's delete this. Let's use that. Grab. Copy. Oh, oh. So we have these two. This is not great. <laughs> it's like this shouldn't be connecting here. Ah, oh, so nice. Uh, oh man. Okay. Let's do it that way. Uh, delete the wire let's do this this way uh, it's a little bit cleaner I guess okay it's not as terrible here in this case because it's a capacitor and a resistor next to each other so it's not as bad and like this and then move and then copy and we can call it left this is something I didn't look up yet because I don't remember which sleeve is left and right on the on the audio connector. And also this audio connector I need to find. Ugh. So many like weird small things that are super boring. It's like, what audio connector are you using? Ugh. Um, duplicate block. Let's make a copy of this. I could use it as a, a separate sheet, I know. Uh, that would be an option too. Shouldn't overlap here. So we can rename this and call it left side. And then rename this. Come on. Come on. Uh, left side. So now we have that. Okie dokie. So that's nice. So now we have the Sylvan system here. <laughs> 500 nano to one micro, yeah, something much bigger. I, I thought so. Uh, we could use, I do have 0402 in one micros, but I think we should put a bigger footprint in here. Same thing with these guys, we should use a bigger footprint so that we can have the option of uh, putting um, uh, film resistors in here just for testing purposes to see if that actually improves the audio quality. Brandon, thank you for a follow. Welcome to the stream. <laughs> yeah. Huh. 
100 microfarad. Yeah, so I, yeah, something huge. Yep, yep. And then we have to also change those resistors. So it, in a sense, these are placeholders for now. They are, they are, we will have to tweak the circuit to actually get something working. I actually don't think we will be using headphones. We can test it with headphones really quick, but it pretty much immediately I will connect this to probably like a USB sound card or a, pre, a headphone preamp to actually use uh, in, a, in an actual uh, environment. So you could think about this like a line out maybe in a sense, when line outs are pretty loud, right? They are like higher voltage or something. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh, but yes, definitely we will, I can change this and call it 100U. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> just for the fun of it. And then we need to change the footprint here and put, ooh, I don't have bigger, I have only 0603 still on. Oh, no, capacitors I have bigger, that's fine. Uh, 1206, that should do, or 1210, 2010. Yeah, tw let's do 1206 for now. You need a bit bit larger one. Yeah, or I assume that's what you meant, Silva. Uh, assume something more like 10 microfarad. Yeah, yeah, something. I, I will, so yeah, I, I will change these footprints probably into an even bigger. So uh, 2010, how big are those? 2512? Let's go on DigiKey and take a look. Like, let's take a quick peek. Let's see what MLCC gives us for capacitance, the biggest one, unless we go with electrolytics for the AC coupling. Uh, okay, so capacitor. Let's look at ceramic capacitors. What do we have here? Yeah, that's why you like the amp. Yeah, that makes sense. Because you don't need huge caps. That makes sense. Yeah, we will probably transition to a to a amplifier in the next revision. Just wanted to make this a slightly easier. 10 microfarad, so yeah, 10 microfarad, there's a 100 microfarad, and let's see how huge that thing is in MLCC. So there are some, and what is the package that they come in? 1206, it's not that bad. 0805 even, yeah, let's not go that, that crazy. Yeah, let's put like a 1210, 1206, 1210, something like that footprint on there. Check voltage. Good point. Good point. Very good point. Uh, yeah, we need something because we are 3.3 volts, so we want something above that at least. So 3.6 volts and higher. Yeah, let's not go four. Let's give ourselves a good margin there. Uh, yeah, so there are 10 volt parts. What is the size of package that we end up here with? Uh, 1206, it's a 1206 part. So yeah, we can put a 1206 part on here. That should be, that's, Sounds reasonable. So 1206 is fine. Yeah, yeah, this is, let's see, wait. They are probably expensive as hell, but yeah, not that we really care in this. <laughs> Single units, one and a half dollars <laughs> for a capacitor. <laughs> 
<laughs> Man, yeah, but there is uh, one and a half dollars, one point one dollars. Nice, yeah, three dollar caps. Woo, yeah, exciting. That's audio file for you, right? That's how it works. <laughs> It's an audiophile capacitor because it costs three dollars. Okay, uh, so yeah, let's do the 1206. Um, yeah, probably I will have to change this to be... What the hell? Why is this showing this? It should be disabled. Um, I should probably... I should probably... Uh, go with uh, like electrolytics or like film capacitors here instead. <sighs> Eighty percent loss at five volts. Oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's there's cr some crazy stuff out there, but you can't cheat physics at some point, right? <laughs> can push physics, but you can't cheat it. Uh, yeah, so where was I? I'm, I'm distracting myself quite quite well today. Alrighty, so let's copy this. Oh, it should be probably in the... It should be uh, 6.4 V, V or higher. Just to have margin, right? There. Something like that. Ah, oh, I'm now flailing now. Great. And this, and this, there we go. Good, good, good. Oh, I should change the value here, right? Should be 100, 100 nano, no, oh, micro, you, there we go. Good, good, good. Uh, these, I want to be also a large footprint because we might want to go to foil. So let's put 1206s here everywhere too. I think we were looking at the foils yesterday and um, they took uh, some significant space too, even at lower values. Oh, come on, Peter, learn, stop being dumb. Uh, there we go. Yes. I could actually edit it in mass in the table here. This is pretty silly. 4.7, like this. I'm not sure the visibility is. Uh, let's change footprint group show oh this is just for the control here okay so let's um, visible and edit come on there we go uh, the resistors can just stay 0402s I don't need to do anything weird about this Twelve ten. Wow. You can make a twelve ten fit on a twelve oh six pad. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's like yeah. I, I think I did that at some point. I squeezed in some weird massive part. Uh, so the only thing that is missing a footprint is the this guy and the audio jack. 
<laughs> Zoidberg's armpit, welcome to the stream. That's a good nickname. <laughs> Where are the noodles on the floor? Uh, yeah, welcome to the stream. Thank you for your follow. Cool. So we have this. And all we need now, I think, is the footprint for this part and the footprint for the audio jack. I think I will just take the footprint from Bob. It was a nice, because I really like that connector though, uh, because it's nice and transparent. It's a very neat connector here. I like it. Let's see. Yeah, you see the... Uh, I have another headphone set that I can play with. I will just use these for a second. I hope this will not break it. It's a very cool connector. I really like it. There we go. And you see the action of the buttons too. So yeah. <clears throat> so I think I will just copy it over from his library. Uh, to do that, how do I do this the stupidest way? Uh, I have to figure out how I copy stuff from these two libraries because they are not loaded at the same time when I go in his design, I think. Uh, okay, so let's do this. Let's open his design. Audio repair. There is a library that he has. The Switchcraft. Samphora, welcome to the stream. Thank you for the follow. So yeah, this is the symbol. We want to copy it over. And how do we do this? Because my libraries I don't think are loaded here. Yes, so I think temporarily I have to go into preferences, manage symbol libraries, project specific libraries, and add my library. Where would that even go? Connectors, I guess? Yeah, I think connectors. Let's go projects, uh, icebreaker, icebreaker PMOD. Library, PKL, and then connectors. Not the pretty, that's the wrong one. So connectors, do we have a connector one? Yes, we do. Okay, now let's go into the library again. And where is the audio repair? Audio repair is this switchcraft file save as. I am looking forward to the new format for the symbol libraries where I can just copy a file over. Then I can just copy the the footprint I can just copy over to my library on the command line. And but here PKL PKL connector and switchcraft is saved. So let's save this. Save all changes. Okay, so that's saved. So I should have that symbol now. We still need the switchcraft footprint, which is in audio repair switchcraft. But I think I can just copy it over on the command line, which makes it easier. Stealing stuff from Bob. Woo -woo. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> it's good stuff. Uh, so where are we? So CP. Uh, where is this project located again? I forgot again. It's in one bit C. Project one bit C. Uh, uh, 
one bitsy uh, audio audio repair and then library and then one bitsy no this is the wrong version version 0 0.3 I think lib audio repair pretty and then switchcraft you can copy this over to lib pkl pkl con good that's copied over now let's open the project recent gamepad let's place this let's see if it is here now pkl con switchcraft very nice 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 uh, so let's rotate it over y I still have to check which one is which. So this is ground, I know. So I get that. Um, the two and five, what are were those? Um, so we can delete this. We don't, I don't think we need a separate one here. Oh, come on. And something along those lines. We can swap the order in a second. Five would typically be left channel. Okay, so I, I by accident got it right. Okay, awesome. Reset public, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I don't think we will be connecting these, so we should mark them as NCs, not connected. So now we have this connector. Now let's see if we can uh, get the footprint to show up. PKL con and switchcraft. Okie dokes, very nice. So the last thing that we are missing is the footprint for this fella here. Let's see, it should be in the standard library maybe. Should be maybe, who knows, we will see. Uh, pin configuration, SOT88. So first of all, let's see what the availability is because I didn't even DigiKey. I see that uh, Uwe is awake. Maybe he will also show up in the chat at some point. <laughs> Uwe Hermann from Seagrog. See, he's like doing stuff on on the social media. So maybe he will join join our stream too. Who knows? If you are here, Uwe, say hello. <laughs> okay, so it seems that the 6xdfn, xfdfn is, uh, exists. How big are those? So it's a 0 0.9 by one. Then there are the SCs. Uh, First of all, we want them to be in stock, right? They seem to be in stock. What is mostly stocked in here? Wow. Actually, the biggest stock is... Oh, it's factory stock, so they have to ship it from the factory. But yeah, either DFN... There are two types of DFNs, the Exxon, right? Oh, what, what happened? Uh, oh, what did you do, Peter? Come on. There we go. 
So we have the, oh, this, you won't see this because it's on the right side here. I'm um, sorry. Oh, no, actually it is visible. Um, so there's uh, the X2 DFN09. So this is XDFN and then this, how do they call it? And then we have the 6TS SOP or SOT 363. Still trying to figure out which one I want prefer. These are a little bit of more of a pain in the butt because you cannot solder them from the side. These are easier to handle because they have the exposed pad on the side, I think. Uh, so you can uh, rework them easier, even though these are totally fine to rework. Uh, SOT. So no matter which one I choose, this looks much more similar to the one that I currently use for the level shifters. Let's see what the pitch is. So E1 is point, point 0.35, point 0.35, and this is point 0.5 probably, no point 0.3. They are both so but so so dense now. Is that the footprint? E1.35. This is the other one. Yeah, it's 0. 0.5. So let's use the 0. 0.5 version. It's like 0. 0.35 is really dense. It's a, it's annoying. Uh, so yeah, let's do use this. So Exxon 6. Let's see if we can get a footprint for that. Why doesn't the Discord page link to a Discord server? I'm not sure which you mean. I, the link is to the one bit squared store that uh, is the communication page and they, this is the plugin, the like uh, blob. I'm not sure which, which exact place you, you mean because I usually link to the one bit squared pages chat because that has like the weird uh, Discord uh, uh, applet thing where you can see that that there is a lot of people there uh, it's better than I feel like it's better than having the invite link just uh, laying around because it updates the invite link and if there is some problem of too many people coming in there and causing trouble I can easier take it down I can stop that I think and then I don't have to update it everywhere that's the thought behind it uh, I don't know what I'm using here on Twitch uh, as a plugin under the video. Place those pads. Uh, which which footprint? Oh, you mean the uh, the Exxon? Uh, which Bob? Which uh, footprint are you talking about exactly? Is that the? for the uh, switchcraft uh, part or what did, what did you oh the pads for the switchcraft was a pain in the butt to place oh yeah yeah they are they're completely arbitrary and random <laughs> yeah you yeah uh, thank you for making that footprint i really appreciate it i remember you complaining about this quite a quite a bunch for a good reason yeah it was a it's a painful footprint uh yeah oh the link that the streamlabs thing is posting that's probably what you're talking about so this this is a link to the one bit squared store this is our store and then uh, there is a link to discord from there uh it is a more reliable link than uh, having a discord invite in there I think I also don't have like a dedicated URL to the Discord server yet when I was posting it. I will look into that, maybe update it. So thanks for the heads up, Semaphora. Ah, pop-up plugin stop. Yeah, so, sorry about that. Yeah, I will, I will uh, look into uh, linking to it more directly in the future. I have no idea what K Tech Lab is. 
the KiCad is the open source software of choice for PCB layout at the moment, as far as I know. I don't think there is uh, anything comparable out there besides uh, um, GDA PCB, uh, which is not, it's much, it's different. It's very different. It's very script, scriptable, but it's, uh, it's feel much harder to use. Oh, that's an IDE though. That's a different thing then. Yeah, I don't know. I have not tried it. Yeah, KiCad does simulation too. KiCad has simulation built in too. It's more generic. It's not a specific thing for PIC. Mm, all right, so uh, let's look into the... Yeah, so also it's like I've never heard of K uh, Tech Lab. For, that's the first time I've ever heard about this. I pretty sure the community using KiCad is much bigger. Also, KiCad is meant to be a professional PCB layout and design software first, first and foremost. And uh, only secondary is like, oh, we try to still make it easy enough to use for a casual user and a beginner. So this is, this is uh, the main goal is uh, professional use. And uh, and it definitely accomplishes a lot of that. It's like it's becoming much better for actual PCB design. And it does have integration for simulation, so you can do that. It's a fairly-ish newer feature. It's like 5.0 release, I think, got it for the first time. Anyways, uh, let's see. Package, Son, Vson. Vson, Exxon. There are some Exxons here. So what is the pad? Let's see. Uh, I need, what are the dimensions here that I need? So this is D. D would be 1.45 by one six pins oh nine one point six oh nine by this is for the EP this is not what I expose pad I don't that's not what I care about well, these are Vsons they have the ground pad Pauson I probably will have to draw it Uson I don't see an Exxon. There are DFNs, so DFN might be closer. DFN 6, 1.3 by 1.2. 4, 4 millimeter pitch. Yeah, I think we have to draw our own. Is this our quads? This is Texas. I would imagine that there might be might be a, a vendor specific footprint somewhere. QFN, WQFN. Anyways, let's just take this one and modify it for our needs. It's the faster, probably, route. CMS Visser, thank you for joining the stream. <laughs> See you later. Yeah, I, I am. I would bet that the tool you are talking about is much more specific to a certain use. I I don't know much about it. So this is meant as a PCB layout software first in general to like do PCB design. It's not like a specific purpose uh, application. So. 
Syndrome 88, welcome to the stream. Thank you for joining. Okay, so where was I? I think I will just take the package DFNQFN, as I said, I will take this one. I could actually also use the generator for this, but uh, this might actually be a good exercise here. File, save as. You should uh, call it correctly. There is my... There we go. So we call it Exxon 6. So does it have a better name? Like a more industry standard name? It's DFN 1010. I think that's what it is. DE would be 1, 1.45. DFN 6. X should be 1.45. And one point four five one. One and then here will be five. There we go. And we should save it into PKL. Uh, Sob QFP DFN QFN. Let's save it here. Save. And we can now move this to position X. So we should. Uh, First of all, these should be round rects, first of all. <laughs> but yeah, let's adjust the foot the pad size. So this should have next to that should be a footprint for this recommended footprint, right? There's no recommended footprint for this. Great! Yay! They don't offer a recommended footprint. That's wonderful. That's very annoying. <sighs> I would have to dig into JDEC again. I don't like that. I don't want to do this. Uh, MO2025. SOT 886, maybe that's what outline version. I think they have a separate document for that, that's right. Package version. Top marking, outline drawing. And footprint, there we go, perfect. Thanos DB, welcome to the stream. Thank you for the follow. Um, yeah, so that would work. So it is 0.5, that looks good. 1.7? Is that the occupied area? Yeah, something like that. Anyways, I need a very, very short break and I will be back and we will finish with the footprint. They have a 3D models too. Yeah, I, c I will probably copy it from there too. All right, be right back. Just give me a second.
All right, I'm back. Sorry about that. <clears throat> All right, so we have this footprint, so we can copy it over. So the width should be 3.37 by 425. Four, so x425. X four to five, four to five, and this is point three seven, three seven, and then we want it to be rounded rectangle, just because we do like that. Let's see, is that correct? Three seven. 425, yeah. It's like quite square pads there. 42537. Okay, so now we can copy this over. Uh, pads, copy pad properties. Now select pads. Come on. Shift. And then right click and pads. Paste pad properties, and now they're all the same. That's one. Now we should do the positioning. Yeah, I am confused about the 0 0.7 and 1.25. So let's see, uh, what does it do here? D, big D, and big E. Big D is four or five. So is it bigger? It's like 0.25. This is 1.7, they say, in that other document. So it's uh, four or five. Oh, it's probably with the with the um, courtyard. One four five. Yeah. So this should be. 1.45 divided by 2. No, that's for x, not y. Wait, 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 wait. Um, and this should be 1 for this outline. So it should go 0.5 and then 1.45 divided by 2 and then 0.5 and one zero point uh, one point four five divided by two. Is that correct? Yes. So that's correct. And if we change this to be this resolution, then we can just do that. Should move this one. Y should be 1.45 divided by 2. And Y uh, 0 .1, 1.45 divided by 2. There we go. So that's why. And we will move this and move. Should make the cutoff on the corner a little bit smaller. Like that. There we go. There we go. Let's make this uh, corner cutoff a little bit less uh, significant. Okay, let's do. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let's do this this way. And then, come on, let's take this one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That should be enough. Like 
Look at that. There we go. Snap, snap. And this should be X position. We should uh, figure out what the X position should be. 0 0.675. Zero point six seven five divided by two. X position and Y position should be uh, point five plus so point seven five, correct? That's too far. Oh, it's point five. Ugh. Yes, 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 I know. So it is from here, just 0.5, okay. Just 0.5, y is 0.5. And I did copy this. It's just a very odd number here. I'll cancel. Oh. Come on, select it. <laughs> Let's do it. Come on, it was not, that's not correct. It's on the other side. There we go. So I think we are then done. Oh, come on. Why are you doing this? I did, I did the selected. I selected this one and I did it, not the previous one. Why are you doing weird shit with selection still? Ah, oh, so annoying. All right, there we go. And we can move this fella, and this should be, because this is, uh, Y position is seven, two, five, so plus two, five. So it is this. Y position should be this plus, no, minus, Point two five, like this, because uh, you usually want uh, point two five millimeters uh, area around each part for placement accuracy reasons. That's uh, the rule of thumb thing. Especially it is significant in big parts, obviously. So minus. 5 plus 2, 5, so it's 7, 5. And 0.75 positive and negative is still this one. X, Y position. Why is this weird? Ah, oh, come on. Why is this weird? 975. Ah, okay, that's fine. Minus 0.75. This is 0.75. There we go. 
Now the outline here. The reference, I use it on FFAB. I can do that in my own library. If I'm not sending it upstream, so I can do this. <laughs> like this. Like this. go. And seven five and this one goes like this and positive. So that's done. And last one. Seven five. And done. Good. Okay, so now we can save this. That should do it. And we can fix the footprint for these guys. We can do it in the table. And load it from PKL DFN and DFN six. Huh, it's a very similar micro pack. Huh. I already have a very similar footprint in my library, I didn't even realize. <laughs> Interesting. They are different though. It's like they have different widths of um, pads. Interesting. I probably will have to dig into this a little bit. Okay, so I think we have everything. Now we can we have all the footprints, that's good. Now we can update the board. Annotate, update PCB, close. And now we have this wonderful thing. So now the question is, um, how do we do, where do we put the, uh, the things? So yeah, I think this will be something for another stream because we are already beyond our time. Yes, we are. It's like we are live about 15 minutes over. So yeah, uh, we at least did the schematic and added all the footprints. I might still do some, so I will, I'm not saying I might, I will definitely do some work offline and continue uh, laying this stuff a little bit out, like pushing it a little bit forward. Uh, I think the next stream will be on Thursday, if everything goes well. I will definitely announce it probably tomorrow so that uh, everyone knows when the next stream is. And we will hopefully finish the first revision of the board on Tuesday. So I will probably put some effort into this Maybe not, I d it really depends on how much time I will have um, regarding other things that I'm working on. And uh, this looks fairly good in general, so uh, we can probably, this will probably go on the end of the board. This is what I'm not sure I like is because the audio path will go all the way across the board, but um, 
that's the, probably the best thing we can do because these can be vertical, the gamepad con connectors, and the audio will be on the end. So I think we will have the pins from the, we will have the drivers. That's the question now. Is it better to drive the FPGA signals all across the board and then amplify it or amplify it or amplify it or go through the buffers first as soon as they come on the board and then run the signals to the audio connector. Probably the second is make, makes more sense because these signals will be stronger um, and then have the uh, passive uh, circuitry, the capacitors and uh, the capacitive coupling and the filters near the audio connector so that a strong signal goes across the board. Drive the FPGA all along the board. Okay. Hmm. Okay. That's uh, Sylvain says this way, instead of using the buffers and the inverter first. Noise on those doesn't matter. Okay. Well, then we will do the circuitry all close to the audio connector. Ah, they go through a Schmidt trigger. Right, 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 right. So they are not very analog, they are very digital and they go into the buffers that have a Schmidt trigger inside. Now, yes, that, that makes logical sense. Thank, thanks, Sylvain, for, for clarifying. That's, so we take the digital audio, essentially, so PWM audio signal that comes in here, and we will go, then go into the uh, buffering inverter that have a, has a Schmidt trigger, will clean up the signal, and then output it into the analog circuitry, so analogize it by running it through the filter. That makes much more sense. Cool. So I will do that this way. And um, yeah, so we are getting closer. I still have to check that these footprints are correct for the connectors. I will definitely for the next stream show you how these connectors look, why I like them, and I have a crimp tool for them anyway, so this is something I, I might show you. And for now, uh, this is uh, the status we have, and uh, we will definitely squeeze it, and we probably have to make the board a little bit longer, but in general it should all fit on there. And we will have a nice new toy to play with without too many complicated parts. It's like, these things are so tiny. That's so cool. Uh, anyways, so that would be it as uh, per usual. Uh, thank you very much for supporting these streams. I hope you had fun, you learned something and or just enjoyed hanging out. I definitely did, as always. And uh, as I said, as I say every stream, uh, shameless plug, one bit squared, check it out downstairs <laughs> if you need some hardware. If you don't need any hardware but you still want to support the streams um, and uh, the stuff that I create here and share because it, uh, it does really help financially if uh, um, with uh, through Patreon and through other means like subscribing on Twitch. So check out the Patreon link uh, below if you want to chip in a few few bucks here and there to help out with the gear and uh, um, allowing me to make these streams and create content. So thank you very much for those that uh, backed already. The Patreons are making it possible at all that I can do this uh, and do these streams. Of course, if you don't have any money, don't worry. That's uh, <laughs> understandable. Um, uh, so uh, the the people that I have to thank to is uh, uh, <laughs> uh, are the um, patrons that chose the level of uh, support that uh, gets a shout out, and these are um, Edward Borden, Jody Parky Rodriguez, Sid Price, Kelly, Tom Keddy, Drew Fustini, and Go Jimmy Pie. So uh, thank you very much for supporting these streams and helping out. And uh, for now, I see you soon. And if you have been, thank you for watching. Bye.